really a pleasure being here this morning. I, I, I really, I am honored and, and the only downside is I had to get up early and put a tie on this morning. But, but I really am, am, am really pleased to be here. I like to keep this session, if possible, as informal as possible. Okay, And, and to, to start with, um, at the end of the session, we're going to take the last couple of minutes and there's going to be a, a test and those in the last three rows are going to have to answer the questions orally. So if you don't want to be um, spotted out, you know, come, on, come on up. This, this ain't church. Come on. Come on down. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, front row, front row center. I love it. Okay. <laughs> Before we get started, and I, I'm, I'll tell you a little bit more about my background uh, as we go on. But before we get started, I'd like to get a little understanding of y'all. I, I moved here 15 years ago, and I learned that's really a term that's used. Um, I'd like to get a little, little better understanding of, 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 of y'all and who you are and, and where you're coming from. Are there any... Are there any registered or certified professional healthcare clinicians here? Okay. Um, and, and how many of you are in the uh, undergraduate program? And in the graduate program? And the others aren't in any program at all? Graduate, okay, all right. Um, good, well that, that gets me a little, little bit of understanding. How many of you have worked in a hospital either as a volunteer or just worked in a hospital before? Super, okay. And how many of you have worked in a doctor's office? Okay, so we have good, good variety of experience. A little bit about myself, I've, I've been in the industry about four decades, um, really dating myself here. Uh, but I've worn a number of hats, I've worn a hat of a provider working in hospitals. Uh, I'm a reforming hospital administrator. Uh, worked in PHOs, physician hospital organizations, which I'm sure you've learned about in, in prior sessions and, and breakfasts. And IPAs, which are uh, independent physician associations, which is the group that I ran, for example, in, in Kingsport for 800 doctors. I ran that for 10 years. I've also wore the hat of purchaser. When I was with a, a hospital, I was in charge of HR. We were self-funded, self-insured, so we were responsible as an employer for provision of health benefits for our employees. I appreciate that side of the, that side of the business. I've worked for investor-owned hospital companies, a couple of them, uh, large ones, management consulting firms, including Ernst, a large CPA firm, and Kearney, an industrial engineering firm. And I've also worked for an entity that functioned as a health plan, a provider-owned PPO. And if I'm using any terms that need, need explanation, just, just let me know here. But over the last two decades, over the last 20 years, I've had the opportunity, and I guess that's really one of the reasons Tim has asked me to talk with you this morning. I've had the opportunity to start up and manage two, IP, uh, two IPAs and three PHOs. And uh, two of the, one of the IPA-PHO combinations are clinically integrated. And the other one, the most recent one that I started up, the PHO in Denver, is well on its way toward clinical integration. In clinical integration, I, I believe, is, is, is a term that was discussed at length in, in prior sessions. So I wear a lot of hats, and, uh, but at least I, I, I have each other. Okay. Um, what I like to do is, is see if we can convert a lot of knowledge, okay, and this is your objective in life, okay, Knowledge is what you get at school and the university or go, go to the library. Libraries are free. You do a lot of research, reading, etc. cetera. The, the trick is using it, okay? It, it's, it's converting it into, into developing that which is, is applicable to a life, to your life. So let me take a, take a little uh, see a show of hands here and just to set the stage a little bit for the industry if we could. Looking out three years to 
three years, five years to, uh, I'm not good at math, 2016. Um, a couple of true false questions here. Uh, physician autonomy in the private practice of medicine will be well re re rewarded. That is, if you, if you stay solo and work by yourself and work hard in your own private setting, you're, you're going to reap, you're going to do really well. True? False. False. Thank, okay. Medicare and Ten Care reimbursement per unit of service will increase significantly. <laughs> the, more, the more you do, the more you're going to get, right? Providers will be able to rely on cost shifting to commercial reimbursement as the primary mechanism to subsidize Medicare and Ten Care. So the private employers are going to continue to be taken and raked over the coals going forward to the benefit of the healthcare industry. I don't think so. I think they're all going to drive down to a standard set of reimbursement. Medical records, y'all that worked in hospitals and physician offices, medical records will still be paper five years out. False. Okay. Fee for service will be the primary payment mechanism for healthcare providers. Again, get paid on a producing a widget basis. The more p patients you see, the more patients you accommodate and admit to the hospital. No, nope, that's false too. There will be a huge financial rewards for providers that reduce cost and improve quality. I would say that's a truism. What I'd like to do this morning is really go through briefly Accountable Care Act, talk a little bit about the, the ACA, the delivery system reform, talk about the roles and functions of the players, assembling and how to assemble the players and their relationships, talk a little bit about basics of human behavior and uh, tools and this is really, I think, what, what Tim has wanted me to do, is talk about tools for achieving those goals. And, and, and then as we go along and at the end, uh, have some discussion on this. So let's talk about some market trends in health reform. And, and the, the Health Reform Act, PACA, known as ACA, the Accountable Care Act, okay, and there was, it's being litigated by the Supreme Court, et cetera. But I believe it's mostly about health insurance reform. And if it's too dark and anybody starts snoring, I'm going to hear you. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'd prefer if it doesn't. If it doesn't, can, can you all see the screen with the light on? Okay. Um, but but it really is 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 about payment reform, um, and, and it it also does impact the delivery reform. For doctors and hospitals, the Accountable Care Act really is a way that is going to decrease their reimbursements, their, their, their payment schedules. It's going to decrease the way they are paid on a widget by widget basis and pay more for value. Um, the, the government schedules are, are, are basically, it says right here, not keeping pace with inflation. There is currently, the, due to the SRG, the sustainable uh, SGR, sustainable uh, growth rate formula that was imposed during the Bush era, um, physician fee schedules are slated to reduce by 29.7% January 1 of next year. 27, 29.7%. There's a lot of discussion in Congress, and, and I believe part of this reconciliation discussion that's underway in the Senate as we speak now is addressing that particular issue. There are a number of proposals on the table, but it, the reductions have been postponed over time, and it's scheduled to, to reduce. Um, they must, uh, providers need to return their, their, their current commercial base because the commercial payers do currently cross-subsidize. Uh, you need to begin to clinically integrate, coordinate care. You need to work together as a provider, as a hospital, as a physician. You need to, 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 to work together to really survive going forward. And, and, and I really believe that, that the old time practitioner, Marcus Welby, and my dad was one of them. He was a solo general practitioner who made a house call the day he died. He died with his boots on. You know, the, the day of, of those practitioners are gone. 
<laughs> Health care reform is the most substantial piece of legislation since Medicare. There's no question about it. And I believe a big part of it is modeled after the HMO Act of 1973. I don't believe there's anybody in this room who remembers the HMO Act of 1973, but I was in the industry working for Ernst, and I was their local quote-unquote expert because I read it and understood it. And it was a precursor to Hillary Care. Okay? But this act is very much uh, based on that HMO Act of 1973. The goal of the government is to increase the scope of insurance coverage and allow greater access to more Americans. Now, how can you do that at, at, at lower cost, et cetera? It's, 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 it's a pretty complex subject. Where are we now? We are functioning as a series of silos. Typically, a provider, a physician office, functions as a physician office. You go to that physician office and if it's your primary care provider, if you need a, you know, your annual checkup, et cetera, and he says, oh, you need to have, a, it's time for your annual colonoscopy, what do they do? They pick up the phone, they try to call the GI doctor and send the paper charts. If they're lucky, they call and they schedule you, okay? Does information go from the primary care doctor to the gastroenterologist before your, your exam? Typically not today. When your exam is done, does a GI typically send the information back to your doctor? Typically not. We're all, we're all functioning independently as, as, as silos. And why do we do that? Because there's no incentive for cooperation and collaboration. Let's look a little bit about reimbursement here. Today's incentives for reimbursement. What I have along the top here are different modes of reimbursement. And what I have along this column is, are different types of encounters. You've got your hospital admission. You've got, after you're admitted, you've got your length of stay, your day, every day. You've got a diagnostic procedure, the therapeutic procedure physician visit encounter, and then your preventive services. Along the top grid, fee for service, okay? I, everybody know what fee for service is? That's where you get paid for an encounter. Everybody know what a per diem is? That's where the hospital gets paid one fixed fee for every day that the patient is in the hospital. The DRG, the next column, is where the hospital gets paid a fixed case rate a fixed amount of money based on the patient's diagnosis at the time they're admitted to the hospital, regardless of how long they stay in the hospital or the services rendered while they're in the hospital. Okay? And capitation is kind of like the Kaiser system or what health plans have. Cap capitation is where it is a, a global payment out of which everything then becomes an expense. All services rendered are expenses. Okay, so what you have here is a dichotomy. And just, a, 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 just for your hospital admissions, you've got incentives for the hospitals for everything with the exception of capitation. For the hospital day, you've, yes, they get paid for every hospital for, on a fee for service and for every, account, uh, every day they're in. But there's... There's no in, in incentive for a hospital day here. They, they want to get the patients out as quickly as possible because every day in the hospital, once they get the per diem, becomes an expense item to them. So they want to get the patient out. Under capitation, you don't want to admit the patient in the first place. So it's, there, there's, there's, you know, the capitation here is, is the opposite. Diagnostic procedure, same sort of thing. And then you get your physician encounters. So you see, you got a whole bunch of yeses and a whole bunch of noes. I mean, we could spend a whole morning on this chart and talk through the, the, the complexities of it. But basically, what it, what it shows is that, is that today's healthcare executive is torn between differing modes of reimbursement. When a patient presents to the registration desk at the ED or at the front door at the, in the registration department, you know, do they make a determination at that time as to the services that they're going to provide to the patient based on mode of reimbursement? 
I, I don't know. Some do, some don't. Most of them don't. Most of them provide the same care to everybody regardless of whether it's a per diem or fee for service or, or, or whatever. So <clears throat> what we need to do is look at changing our system, changing the way we do business, and uh, uh, getting different results. I've got a couple slides on here of, of, of an ACO. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because you spent a whole session on them earlier. But in my mind, I just share with you that there are four cornerstones to an ACO, and it's clinical integration, care coordination, financial management, and information technology. Now, the next slide, though, is, is one that, that, that I believe, in my mind, it's very convoluted but it shows the interaction of the parts. And it's one that I have used repeatedly, successfully in prior meetings when I meet with executives or doctors or whatever trying to explain ACOs and show how the parts and the players and the reimbursements work together in an ACO setting, in a comprehensive delivery system with the different modes of reimbursement that we have today. Uh, you know, the ACO is, in, is a center of it. You've got the spectrum of care, which is basically your, your, your four elements of services. Your preventive, your diagnostic, your curative, and your chronic condition, your management. Okay? And it really, really shows the role. And again, if anybody has any, you know, here are the, the episodic intervention, here are the continu continual management, here are the preventive and the chronic condition. And it, it really shows the role of the patient centered medical home and health coaches and how they're used in, 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 in the spectrum, care navigators. Okay, which I'm sure you've talked about in prior sessions, transition coaches used for discharging patients and keeping them out of the hospital to mitigate unnecessary readmissions, practice coaches to, to talk and work with the practices relative to um, uh, the lean management and incorporating practice guidelines in the flow of the patient, et cetera. It's, you know, this is a, a slide that, that is used uh, repeatedly. To, to help explain an ACO and the components, as I say, to, uh, to various uh, um, uh, players in, in the industry. And as I, as I go along, if there are any questions, please just, just interrupt, let me know. So what we need to do going forward is, is take all these silos, okay, and, 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 and pull them together. Pull them together in a, in a way where they, they, they work together, they cooperate, they're, they're, they're collaborative. We need to coordinate them. We need to coordinate care is a big part of, of health care going forward. And, and, and care coordination is basically, I keep pushing the wrong buttons here, basically, um, you know, it's, it's not much more than a deliberate working together or organization of patient care activities between two or more participants, including the patient or the patient's caregiver, okay, in, in, involved in the, in, in, the, in the location where that person gets the care. The uh, care coordination ring, I'm not going to spend time on this either, but, but you really do, uh, you know, this is out of the AHERC. And if you all have not gone to the AHERC website, it's a, it's a good one to go to to, to, to to help put a lot of the care coordination, ACO integration, clinical integration in perspective. But it's, uh, it's uh, um, you know, it, it just uh, the, the care coordination ring, taking the patient and the family perspective with a health professional and the system representatives coordinating everything, okay, working together, interconnecting those silos, sharing information, sharing protocol, sharing best practice, sharing information, having everything, everything work, work together. The cycle of the seas, okay, I saw this and, and I thought, you know, this is, this is something, <coughs> cooperation, coordination, and collaboration. And, and these are the, the, the three C's, and it's almost a cycle. 
And, and this is collaboration, I believe, is where we need to be as a healthcare delivery system. Right now, some of us are at the cooperation level. Most of us are at the cooperation level. We work independently. We work as a silos. We have our own separate goals and our resources. And we showed that with the reimbursement grid. We all have different incentives. The coordination is longer, longer term, shared rewards. It's a way toward collaborating. Collaboration, I believe, is where all partners contribute and, and they get shared results and re rewards from doing it. And, and you know, when I was back in Denver setting up the PHO, collaboration was a big, big term out there. Not only among and between the providers in the PHO, but in the medical community itself. It's really interesting. You've got here in the Tri-Cities area two systems that, that compete rigorously with one another. Uh, do they as much as cooperate with each other, let alone coordinate, collaborate? I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm not going to answer that question. You, you all know. Um, I am sure, but I'm not going to state my opinion. Um, you all know how they are. Um, and, and there are reasons for that, and it's the last slide I'm showing uh, show here. But but in, in Denver, it, it it was a little. It, it's a similar situation in, in, in that there there are four competing systems out there. But it was really exciting to be able to sit at the table as a member of a steering committee, a care coordination, a care transition steering committee. That, that, that represented the four systems in a, in a care transitions collaborative effort to work together to develop a, a unified, consistent way where we could put the mechanisms in place to mitigate unnecessary readmissions. You know, and it just, here you are sitting at the table with your competition and you're sharing some of your well, here, here's what a CCD or a continuing care document looks like. Here's what we need in terms of discharge information, for example. It's, you know, it, it's really, I believe, where the system needs to go if we are going to be able to, to afford health care uh, go, going forward. Bottom one. Question. There's more of like cooperation and sort of like do you think there's more economies of scale to be gained by sort of cooperative arrangements like that than relative to having a system where you have different entities competing with each other? Questions are there economies of scale that can be achieved? The answer without without question. What it does is it medic it eliminates redundancy, duplication, and waste. Because if you can coordinate and collaborate and share information, test results, for example, and share it with others rather than have the other individual or entity duplicate that MRI of the, you know, your, your sore shoulder, you're going to save a lot of, a lot of cost if, if that's the sort of thing that, that, that you're, you're thinking. Yes, definitely. Excellent question. Thank you. Anybody here sail? Holston Lake? Cherokee? Okay. I grew up in Milwaukee, Lake Michigan. It's a big lake. 99 miles wide, 333 miles long. A little bit bigger than Cherokee, a little bit bigger than Holston. Bigger than Tennessee? Uh, pretty big. Pretty big. <laughs> And, and I, I, I just, I grew up on the water. I, I mean, I just lit, literally, we lived about half a mile from, from Lake Michigan, and, and my, uh, fort, my, my parents had, had a boat and spent a lot of time on it. And I learned when I was just uh, in grade school, I started sailing little, uh, a little 16-foot uh, sailboat made out of plywood. Uh, it was called Lightnings. And they didn't have any motors in them. It was just strictly dependent upon, upon the, the sail and the wind. And I learned at a very, very young age that the fastest way between two points is not necessarily a straight line. 
it all depends on the environment, which way the wind is blowing, and how you have to attack, and how you have to calculate, and how you have to assess the environment around you, not only where you are, but you look for little ripples on the water as to where you're going. And, and that's where you want to go because that's where the wind is, okay? The same holds true with life. Okay? The fastest way between two points is not necessarily a straight line. You need to assess the environment. You need to assess the situation. You need to understand where you are, the environment around you, the people you're dealing with, okay? and, 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 and make your adjustments accordingly to get from point A to point B. Okay? And just within that context, Okay, there's a great line out of To Kill a Mockingbird. You never really know a man until you understand things from his point of view. Okay, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. Okay, it's kind of like the old Indian phrase also, never judge a, 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 a man until you walk a mile in his moccasins. Okay, you need to understand the people you're dealing with in order to deal with them effectively. You need to, in any situation, when you sit at a table to negotiate a contract, to discuss collaboration, to discuss wo cooperative working relationships, you need to really understand the other individual. And my gosh, we learned all this back in high school, didn't we? It's Maslow 101. Okay, you've Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's amazing how many times I, I think of this and, and, and in reality, in a true business world, in a true business world, some of the biggest deals that I've seen done were based on the very level, the, the, very, the, the red level of, of need. Okay, um, you know, it, it just, uh, they're, they're uh, y'all are, graduates I can share. I was, I'd never forget working with a hospital, an investor-owned hospital company years ago that uh, there, there was a motivation and an incentive that resulted in a deal of a hospital acquisition from a one party to another party uh, that was based on an event that occurred, let's just say it occurred in Vegas. And, and the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the the one party discovered the other party's need, accommodated that need, or had that need accommodated, and the deal and the deal went down, literally. Um, oh, no. <laughs> so we also need to understand, I just want to toss this up here, is, is a grief cycle. I'm going to go through this briefly. Helen Kubler-Ross, when I was in graduate school, she was, uh, she was a prolific author. Um, and the grief cycle, we need to understand that too. When you're dealing with individuals and, and, and they are not, you know, and, and they don't do the deal, you need, to, you need to understand the stages that typically they'll, they'll go through. And, and possibly you can, if you know them and their needs, et cetera, you can nurture them through that, those stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance of what, what is, just accept reality. I was sharing with Tim earlier that uh, working in an IPA with 900 doctors is kind of like you've heard the phrase time and again, herding cats. Um, it's... Uh, one of the greatest analogies I've, 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 I've had with an IPA organizationally is, uh, does anybody belong to a homeowners association? And your board meetings go absolutely smooth and everybody gets along with each other and they all agree with, with and they all have common goals? No, 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 no. They all have a significant invested interest independent invested interest but they're together for the better of 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 all of them okay they're they're, they're, they're so so there, there are competing interests at all times and an hoa and an ipa in a pho you've got the physicians and you've got the hospital the physicians have different incentives than the hospitals have okay it, it you follow the follow the money 
okay? In any entity, any organization going forward, you need to understand the, 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 the polarity of the desires and what the, the interest of the different individuals are. Okay, and the six steps then of polarity management, just define what the issue is, what it is, you know, what, what's the outstanding issue. Make sure the people that are the decision makers are there at the table. That in itself is a key to negotiation, okay. How many times, I can't tell you the number of times, I, the, the technique I've used in, in, in negotiating for something for myself personally, for family use, I would go out, I'd chop, okay negotiate what the other individual would say would be the best price ever. And I'd say, I need to ask my wife about that, okay? He made a mistake. The other person made a mistake by not asking the question, can you make the decision, okay? So that left me an opening to, to walk away from the table and come back. It, it's, a, it's a technique, it's a trip, okay? It's something that health plans use typically when they negotiate with providers. I mean, you just, you'll negotiate what you think is the best contract, and uh, you know, ever. And then the person you're negotiating with will say, oh, I'll have to take this to my, to my VP, and, and we'll see if we can approve it here. It's like every automobile deal, isn't it? Yes, it is, see, exactly. Yep, yep. Sure. Yep, and they let you sit there waiting and waiting, and they'll come back and maybe make a counter offer, okay? Mm -hmm. you, 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 can't, you can't win if you're not willing to get up and walk. But build the polarity map, understand how the polarities work, and we're not going to go through that here, but it, it's something I shared with Tim. I think polarity management is a, is a course that would be worth looking into here at the, at the college. It just, it's, a, it's a technique and, and, a, and a process that, that I think is, is um, in its infancy. Assess realities and determine action steps and early uh, warnings. So what I have here is just a picture out of the, you know, off the, uh, out of a book of a, of, of a uh, example of polarity management. It's a polarity map, and, and basically, what it is 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 what they use here as a polarities are are inhaling and exhaling. Um, and, and, and Tim used an example of, uh, of uh, physicians and, and hospitals. Uh, and, and that is, you know, they each have their, their, their own desires, their own needs. And it's a matter of identifying what is, what is best for each and, 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 and really, gosh, I got the, working in a, in a cycle here to, to, to really come to a, come to a compromise. So we've talked about a little bit here. Um, you know, the question is, how do you eat an elephant? You know, it's the, the answer is uh, one bite at a time. Um, and and so some of the the mechanisms that I've used in the past, and 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 I, uh, the number one technique that I've used as an individual and a professional is every time I go into a meeting with an individual, with, with, with a group, with a meeting, whatever, okay? Go out and, 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 and meet with the doctors, go out and meet with whoever I'm going to meet with and try to convince them and bring them on board to a shared vision. The first question they're gonna ask me, and if it's not the first, it's only because they're kind, is what's in it for me? What's in it for me, the doc? Okay, and, and so, you know, the, I, would, I would strongly suggest that any time you do enter a negotiation situation or a situation where you're going to be trying to selling and convincing people to, to come on board and agree with you is to, to give pre-thought as to how you're going to answer that question for that particular individual. How do you do that? You get into that individual's skin you think about the Maslow hierarchy of needs and what is it that that person specifically needs and specifically wants, okay? Is it timely monetary rewards? Is it self-gratification? Is, is it the first level of the Maslow? What is it that that individual needs that needs to be satisfied in order for that individual to come on board and, and, and agree and participate? Okay. Some die, some just you know the 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 the, uh, 
One of the greatest organizations, I think, are ones that have doctors that, that are at the top tier. And, and they want to participate with quality improvement. They want to participate with clinical integration. They, they, because they want to be the top doc among their peers. Because when the, the ratings come out on health grades on the website, and it's going to grade the docs to show how they, how they rank among their peers, they want to be at the top. That's that to you know, and if you share data with the docs, believe me, a lot of them are self-motivated. They will say, "I want to do that. I want to, you know, uh, I, I want to get there. I want to get to the top." Basic tenet, though, before you deal with anybody, before I can deal with anybody, I've got to trust that person, and they've got to trust you, because without trust, it's it's done. It just doesn't work. It's like dealing with a health plan. You got to put everything in writing. You got to you got to you know detailed you know multi-page contracts. Okay, um, uh, there there are some entities that I, I deal with because I have to deal with them, but I don't trust them. So you've got to cover your bases up one side and down the other. Okay, in dealing with individuals, it's it's an absolute shame that we've had to go to contracts because I would, if I trust an individual, I'll do a deal on a handshake. That's all it takes. It just takes, you know, an agreement and trust. And trust has some some basic components, and it's honesty, integrity. The person has integrity. They're responsible. They're going to follow through with what they say they're going to do. Okay. So, coming toward the end here, um, you know, you you all are students. You all are ready to go out and, 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 and make it work, okay? Um, it just, it, it's kind of a neat little phrase here, never be afraid to try something new. Remember, amateurs built the ark, professionals built the Titanic. Um, I recommend some reading here for you. There's two, well, one is a book. One is uh, called Getting to Yes, which is a very good book. You all haven't read it, it's, uh, you have, okay? Um, and then second is, is, a, uh, is lessons, it's, a, it's an article that'll take you five, not even five minutes to read. It's in the latest issue of the American College of Healthcare uh, Executive, and it's by Paul Hiltz, who's a fellow I work with, he's one of my clients. Uh, he is the, currently the president of the PHO up in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, Mer Mercy Health Select. It's an 11 hospital, PHO, 11 hospitals, about 1,200 doctors, fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives. He lives in a little town just south of Cincinnati, across the river in Kentucky. And he was, he's very active in town politics, and he wrote this article. And it was just, you know, it, it just is great. And, and it just, I, I really suggest just, just go to the uh, website and, and Google it, uh, read it if, if you would. And if you'd like me to send you a link or copies of it, I could do that too. I'll just, uh, I'll PDF it and shoot it off to uh, Tim to, to share with everybody. So, um, my parting words. Just do it. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Comments? I didn't draw anybody out, and I apologize. So how do you um, recommend, you know, with incentivizing physicians and whatnot, it's difficult to get past that level of um, you know, what's in it for me on a broader scale, mm -hmm. with overcoming, you know, trying to with value-based care and, and, and accountable, um, you know, everybody wants more money, more resources for themselves. How do you get these clinical systems to start sharing information and seeing that you can eventually, you can get to a point where it's all, it's all going to be spread out evenly. Um, the costs will be shared and we will have mm -hmm. better utilization of resources. I mean, I, of course I'm going to charge, you know, for an MRI, if I can, you know, make money, make you know, we've got the equipment, we've got the machine. Well, there, there you go. You just spoke out of both sides of your mouth there, I, and not to pick on you, but I mean that's exactly what we're dealing with in the industry. Okay, is is you know we're here to maximize what's good for us, but yet we want to be part of a system that's going to have less.
That's where you get into the polarity management. Okay, you you have your 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 conflicting your conflicting uh, uh, goals there, and and basically what you need to do then is a, a num number of things. Number one, you need to trust the individuals who you're dealing with. Okay, you need to trust them. There needs to be trust between them, and if there's not trust, I'm not sure they're going to be able to work together. I'm not sure it's ever going to be able to be achieved. Uh, secondly, what you, you what I believe you need to do is 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 Get the parties to, and I'm a big, this is collaboration. Getting the parties to the table, okay, to, to discuss the issue. <coughs> Party involvement, the, the participants. Everybody wants to be involved, everybody wants a voice, okay? In government, who, who uh, are y'all registered voters, okay? Do you all want to vote and have a voice in who your next leader is going to be of the country? Anybody who doesn't? Okay. Um, you, you have a voice. You have a voice, okay. Having the ability for people to share their voice, get to the table and, and, and discuss the issue. And then create a common vision. And that common vision has got to outweigh what the individual motivation is going to be. Now the common vision in an ACO, for example, and, and this is exactly the dilemma that, that, that I encounter in, in setting up PHOs, and the doctors are asking us, you know, what's in it for me? And the vision is, the reality of life is, your reimbursements are going down, Doc. You're going to be making less, unless you just carve out and do something, you know, that, that's going to, you know, and you, you know, you're going to be wearing orange stripes for the rest of your life. <laughs> You don't want to do that. But reimbursement's going down. What you really need to do is work together, work collaboratively in a, clin in a clinically integrated environment, in a network that has a shared vision of being the best in terms of quality, to minimize waste, to minimize uh, redundancies, to minimize, mitigate unnecessary readmissions, okay, to do, to do what is right and render the appropriate service at the right cost, right expenditure services, okay, for the global capitation. And if we do it all right and share services and through economies of scale, we minimize our expenses, okay, then that which you don't gain, okay, through volume of service through manufacturing more widgets, you get through the shared savings mechanism. That's the whole concept of ACO, shared savings, is there's a shared savings, you all familiar with the shared savings concept? Okay. And, and so they distribute the shared savings. And that's, that's the whole incentive, the whole motivation. But part and parcel to that is creating the infrastructure for the docs to be able to be there at the table to have a voice and determine how they're going to get paid and how that dollar is going to be distributed. That, that is key. And that has led, I believe, to the failure of more PHOs than anything in this country. So PHOs have historically been little P's, big H's. They've been hospital run and hospital dominated. And it's been the hospital that's made the decision as to how that money is going to be allocated and distributed Okay, to the detriment of the physicians. And the physicians don't want that sort of a situation. The physicians need an equal voice at the table with the hospital as it pertains to financial decisions, okay, or decisions relative to the amount of capital that they bring to the, to the enterprise, so to speak. Okay, and, and they, they, they need a voice at the table for, for, for equal voice with financial decisions, but the, phys the hospitals need to realize that physicians need to have a majority voice relative to clinical decisions. And an example I use, um, and, and it doesn't fly too well in, in Cincinnati, but I, I used it, or, or in Denver, but, it, but use it here. It's like, uh, you know, you want to assemble a team. It's kind of like NASCAR. Okay, the team, the PHO, they put together the, put together the car. They've got the team. They've got the, the, uh, the uh, pit row mechanics, the changers, etc. The doc needs to drive it. The physician needs to be the driver. He's the one that's going to be out there on the road feeling it, understanding what needs to be done, what adjustments need to be done, because he's the one that's experiencing the, the actual care. 
So that's, um, yes? I was curious about, it's basically looking at a paradigm shift where we're being faced with capitation increases. So how, what kind of things can um, healthcare professionals do to help facilitate that process? How I get feed conservative with capitation? At, is that you are that is exactly the big the biggest issue with um, that's an issue I'm not sure I have a specific specific answer other than what what many hospital systems are doing is preparing themselves for that transitional shift without penalizing their their revenue flow Okay, that the, if we were to just flip a switch and go from fee for service to capitation, okay, uh, first of all, you couldn't do it because we don't have the infrastructure of the systems in place to do that. We tried that back with uh, the HMO um, managed care 20 years ago and ended up with HMO phobia, uh, you know, where, you know, because of the IBNRs and all the problems with the reserves and, and withholding care, et cetera, there was just a, a pushback against HMOs. Uh, so you can't flip that switch until the, 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 the uh, uh, mechanism, the, the infrastructure is in place. And that's a big part of the ACA. That's why with the ACO uh, uh, section, uh, I believe 3022, what, or whatever the, the section of the ACO, the, the quality metrics are so important or were so important to Don Berwick. Okay, he pushed for the 65 quality metrics in the ACO. And it was only at the significant push of the CBO that they cut back to the 33, okay? So you need to have the quality, which includes um, patient satisfaction. Uh, it includes a number of, of characteristics and, you know, uh, uh, hospital core measures, et cetera, that, that, that need to exist in order to, to, uh, to uh, maximize and make that shift. Now, another thing, a number of hospitals are introducing lean technology. Six Sigma, I don't believe works in healthcare. Lean does. Okay, Six Sigma is a you know you have to create millions of widgets of the same type in order for Six Sigma to work. I mean that's my naive understanding of it. Lean technology, and you you go through a lot of this in your in your QA course, but lean is what a number of hospitals are doing so that they can again eliminate waste, eliminate redundancy in their actual day-to-day -day operations. So that, you know, and, and that's from a, a facility operational perspective. From a delivery system perspective, we go back to my slide of the ACO. And that is where the parties need to work together. The hospitals, the physicians, the home health agencies. I personally was absolutely dismayed to see the government cutting back on reimbursement for home health agencies. To me, if you're looking at mitigating unnecessary readmissions, home health is a service that is very, very much required. And for the government to, to, to impose a system change and reform on mitigating readmissions through the reimbursement uh, changes that they're making, that, they're, that are in place now, um, and, and cut back on the support services that are necessary to maintain an individual in their own residential setting, I think is atrocious, but who am I? I'm just a little guy here in the Tri-Cities. So. I'll just, you know, add, to, referring to the switch that you mentioned, that before we switch from fee-for-service to capitation, I would just reiterate what you mentioned earlier, that you cannot really make that switch successfully both financially and clinically, if you don't have the information technology and the collaboration in mm -hmm. place between mm -hmm. the different types of providers. Mm -hmm. Because the capitation model, I mean, it's premised you know, on the foundation that that collaboration is in place in order to minimize expenses and be able to you know, benefit from the reimbursement mechanism. So, so I think having the collaboration and the information sharing is foundational to the success of capitation. Otherwise, it won't work. I don't know if you, you, you agree with that. You're, you're exactly correct. Information sharing is necessary in order for it to work. My issue is with 
let me phrase it. Issue, yeah, my issue. Okay, I'm pretty candid. My issue is with the government imposing information sharing among all parties without paying for it. Okay? Um, I believe that integrated delivery networks, MISHA, Highlands Wilmot, two integrated delivery networks in our markets, okay, need to have the information technology within their systems and within their models to share, inf to, 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 to share that information. I'm not aware of much cross-pollination of patients between the two systems. So, you know, the big argument is, well, you know, if we have a national system in place and you're visiting Myrtle Beach, okay, and you end up in the ED, well, they can access you and look at your, at your problem list and see what medications you're on. Well, if I'm in Myrtle Beach and I have an accident and go to the ED, first of all, I'm not, I wouldn't go to the ED uh, unless it was a true emergency, and I would hope they don't waste much time looking, looking me up on a computer. But, but, but secondly, um, you know, if they, what's the cost? What's the cost? How many times does that happen? To that, that you need to have a, a information on an individual in such a remote location, okay, uh, for, for, for whatever particular reason. I travel a lot. I traveled a lot, and, and on one of my travels, I mean, you know, same sort of thing. I ended up calling my PCP from Little Rock, Arkansas, okay, and he got on the phone directly with the doc and conveyed that information. How many hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars did we save with that phone call using a telephone instead of having an expensive government-run IT uh, regional health information organization, okay? I think, I think IDNs need to have their own IT infrastructure. And on the same token, though, if the government wants to have a, a regional or statewide or national system, then that's fine. Let the government pay for it. The providers should not have to pay for that interconnectivity. So. And I know that's a little contrary to, uh, I suspect it's a little contrary to what is being advocated by a uh, uh, public health sector. So. But that's my personal opinion, and that's what I'm here for. And you're sticking to it. And I'm sticking to it. Yep. And you vote and vote for me. <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about why you feel, do you feel that this would never materialize if it was up to the, I mean, it's up to the providers to, to fork over, the, to make the outlays themselves? I mean, it seems, I, I can see why. Is that why? Is it just because you think it'll never happen, or do you think it's incentives are all wrong? What, what, what's your, I'm just trying to it, it incentives. It, it, you hit it right, it gets back to what's in it for me. What's in it for me? If I'm a solo practitioner or, or a, a, if I'm Scott Fowler with Holster Medical Group, okay, and I'm going to be spending all this money on, you know, and I am spending money on all my, my IT for Holster Medical Group. I'm not saying this is how he's thinking, but this is my rationale. You know, I, I will do it to benefit my patients and benefit the physicians and benefit my community. But if I have to pay money out of pocket, okay, to, to, to help support a national system, why should I? Where's my payback? Where's my ROI? Why, why should I do it? Now, if you're going to penalize me like you are for not in, uh, implementing an EMR, you're going to penalize my Medicare reimbursement, then, yeah, I guess I better do it. But why should I pay for it? You know, who benefits from it? Do I, as a provider, benefit from, from, from a patient, you know, from a doctor in Southern California accessing the records on my patient? in the middle of summer when they're on vacation, what's my benefit? What's in it for me? And the other thing that's related to this issue of having a system that's interconnected like that is that if you have multiple systems, but one that's developed in, say, Tennessee and another one's developed in Myrtle Beach, sometimes they don't speak to each other. And so they have to have some sort of workaround that sort of makes it seamless. I've spoken with mm -hmm. um, some engineers about that. They were telling me, like, do they speak? They were telling, I was... I think I had spoken with Intermountain Healthcare, mm -hmm. Geisinger, and some of these other systems have they've developed these systems, but a lot of them, from what I understand, and I'm not an engineer, um, and I'm not that particular, I'm, I, health IT is not my area, but from what I understand, is a lot of them don't talk to each other. 
So it would be something that would be seamless or that would connect, interconnect somehow. They, they, there needs to be interconnectivity between the, the IDN IT systems. You're exactly correct. And there are national solutions that are available that do that. Um, uh, Medicity is one. Mobile MD is another. Relay Health is another. Oxalato, which was selected by the state of Tennessee as their system to connect all the, the QOs throughout the state, uh, is another. So, so there, there is technology there, but it's expensive technology. There, there are vendor solutions, yeah. And, uh, but, but it's a matter of, you know, what, where's, the, where's the priorities? You know, I mean, do we start with, with, with fixing our local health problems of obesity and and whatever first or do we do we really jump off into the grandiose you know um, and spend a lot of money on on, on technology I, mean, I just if the government wants to do it that that's fine if that's how they want to allocate the monies but but don't make me as a provider pay for it sir uh, they are working in a larger context of a country facing a big healthcare expenditure with the cost line going up. So uh, though we have what is in there for me at the individual and the practice level, but looking at the bigger scale and you look at the cost trend, we have to do something about the cost trend. So if we all have to play to the game of what is in there for me, how are you going to solve this global problem? The, the, again, it gets back to the polarity management, and I'll, I'll go back to the answer to the question over here, and that is there, there needs to be a recognition that there will eventually be a cap on the reimbursement for the physician. Your, your reimbursement as an individual under the existing current payment system is going down. There's going to be a 29.7% decrease on the books unless Senate acts between now and the end of the year. Okay, it's going to happen. So the what's in it for me is pretty darn important because you're going to be losing 30% of your reimbursement as an individual provider. Using that as a basis, almost a threat or a club, whip them into understanding that there needs to be delivery system reform and they need to be a part of that reform, not to necessarily get more money. Okay, it would be disingenuous for me to go to a doctor and say, participate in an ACO and I'll give you more money. It's, it really doesn't work that way. The sell to the doc is participate in an ACO and you will have a seat in the table and you will be, have a voice on what your future destiny is and be a part of the delivery system, creation of the delivery system that's going to solve this master dilemma, this problem, this global dilemma and have a voice at the table to, to, to help fix it and, and whatever you come up with because you are there as a part of the solution, okay, has got to be better than what somebody's going to impose on you if you're not there. So getting them to the table and figuring it out and creating a, a mechanism that, that works. What is that mechanism? I think the best ACO in the country is, is Kaiser, okay? Now, it's Kaiser that killed the HMO Act in 1973, the, 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 the perception of Kaiser. Everybody was saying, Kaiser's a great health plan until you get sick. I thought it was Harry and Louise. I'm sorry? I thought it was Harry and Louise. <laughs> Harry and Louise, yeah, yeah. It, but it was, it was uh, uh, the reputation of Kaiser is what, is what really, it was really quelled uh, the, the HMO Act of 73. But I, uh, you look at Kaiser and how they function today, okay? They are very competitive in the marketplace. They, they have pluralistic provider networks. They don't own all their hospitals. They're pluralistic and, and it's, a, it's a good mechanism. So, thank you. Uh, you, but again, I want to thank you all for being here, and we want to thank, let's thank you.